If you'll go and turn to John chapter 10, John chapter 10, that's where a lot of our, we'll be studying that, and I will tell you there's a lot in John chapter 10 that can be cross-referenced, um, and we're going to go over some of those cross-references, and you may have some different ones than what I do, specifically maybe some in your, you have little study Bibles and things like that. However, I did want to kind of go over uh, the context, the immediate context, and the broader context that it sits. And the immediate context that it sits is uh, next to John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, what was going on there, and I'll kind of back up just a little bit and let you kind of skim through it real quick. What's that the story of? Yeah, it's the story of the blind man and all everything that kind of transpired over that and how the first question was, you know, of Jesus about the blind man was what from his disciples? What sin did he urge? Yeah, he, who sinned in order for this man to be blind? And Jesus' answer was, nobody sinned, it's so the glory of God can be found and he heals the blind man we know there's a lot of things that kind of go on in there. Well, how he wraps uh, John chapter 9 up in, um, in this was Jesus talking to the Pharisees, and he says in verse, um, verse uh, 38, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. In verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. And then he goes to say in verse 40, those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said, we are not blind too, are we? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin, but since you say we see, your sin remains. And so the question that was asked at the very beginning is now being answered here at the very end of all of this. And what does this show about these healings and about these miracles that Jesus is doing. Are they just simply so a man can see? Glorify the Father. The what? He, he did the miracle. To glorify. He, he glorified the Father, correct? So that, they believe. so that they may believe. And there's lessons to be learned also in this. And you know, this blind man being, being bl born blind and then being healed, well, we see how it kind of wraps up in that whole discussion. So it wasn't just that, you know, I just healed him just so he could see again, but there was a lesson to be taught. And if you kind of go back in all of these um, that, we, that we have uh, been studying, all of these miracles have a lesson to be taught in them. There's a reason that he did it. He, he had a reason. And um, so but we see here that, you know, the Pharisees still, they, they are still blind because their sin remains. It is at that point, in verse 41, Jesus said to them, and I'm going to read verse 41, and we're going to switch right to John chapter 10. Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin, but since you say, we see, your sin remains. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand with what those things were in which he was saying to them. So... It's a continuation of thought, and I want to kind of you know, make sure that we understood that. This isn't something that happens later on. So the continuation of thought is exactly what he said in verse 41. Their sins remained with them, and then he goes right into this, um, into this figure of speech about a sheep uh, and a shepherd and a door. And so we're going to kind of, that's where he kind of sets this up. And I just want to kind of make sure we understand it's still in the context and still in the idea of their blindness. 
So what do we see the very first thing that he's talking about here in uh, chapter 10? Um, what's he talking about this, this idea of the sheep hearing and all this kind of stuff? Well, he says there's a couple of different things here in verse 1. If you're coming in, if you have somebody that's coming in through the window, he's probably not a welcome guest, right? And that's basically what he says here is that that's not the person that ought to be where the sheep are. And instead, they are thieves and robbers. In, um, in this, we also see something else, that there's going to be a distinction between what a good shepherd is and what a bad shepherd is. But right now, what we see, that he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. So he has access to the sheep. Now, there's a difference also between the sheep. What's the difference between the sheep? The ones that recognize the voice. Yeah, there's some that recognize the voice and some that do not. So, in context of what we've been talking about with the Pharisees and their blindness, what do you think he's pointing to? He's the only way. He's the only way? And what about the sheep? Some, some understand, some don't. Some will understand, some don't. Go ahead. You had the blind man that recognized the shepherd's voice, and you had the Pharisees and the leaders who would not. They're they're not uh, they're not of the of the master. They're not the followers of the shepherd because they didn't recognize his voice as sheep would. Right, and there's a very distinct voice that they're listening to, and that voice is the voice of truth that we continue to to see throughout, and. His sheep are starting to follow him. We have a man, and we just talked about the man who worshipped him because of the blindness, you know, but he recognized that there's something special about Jesus, and we talked a little bit about his journey into that faith, whereas he said, hey, there's just a guy, and I think he's a prophet, and then are you wanting to be his follower? And then I see him as Lord and Master. So we see, you know, his progression. So... Is that Jesus kind of calling him and him following? Yes, that's exactly what that is. And so that's where we want to kind of keep this also. All right. In verse uh, 5, what does it say about his sheep and the strangers? They will not follow, but flee from them. Yeah, they're not going to follow them. Now, let's just take, for example, what we just talked about with the blind man. Was he just going along to get along whenever it came, whenever they pulled him into the uh, temple or the um, in, into their midst to question him? Was he just kind of going along with what they said? Go ahead. Mike, he became rather indignant with them because he in, he used repetition and he restated what he told them and said, "Didn't I tell you this?" You know, that he remained constant, he remained vigilant, and he became very uh, distraught with them because of, really, as we know, the hardness of their heart. Right. And I think he also saw where they were wanting to go. Yes. They're, they're wanting to accuse Jesus of something, and he just ain't going there. They're not following along with, their, with that voice. He wasn't about to permit himself to be used as their hammer. Uh, correct. Correct. Very good. And... Um, you know, and so we kind of see that kind of played out in what Jesus just talked about just by what was just seen from this blind man versus the, the Pharisees. All right, so verse 6 says a lot, though. Because it says this figure of speech, he spoke to them, but they did not understand. Now, what did he just get through saying? <laughs> they will know the matter. Yeah, you're you're going to hear the voice and you're going to follow. They, they don't even understand what's going on here what he's talking about. It's like they're kind of dizzy with it, you know, but you know, they're just not hearing it. So already a dividing line is starting to happen. Now how, and I, I want to point this out because whenever we talk about judging and judgments and stuff like that, these people are judging themselves unworthy. And the reason they're doing that is because they refuse to believe what's being stated and now they've gotten around to understand what he's talking about because that distinct voice that Jesus has, they can't hear. And so, we we'll kind of keep that in mind also. Um, in verse 7, Jesus said to them again. Now remember, we have a lot of repeating of ourselves. So Jesus says to them again, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. So he's laid it out for them just so they understand what he was just talking about. Now, if you will, turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18. Ephesians 2 and verse 18. And we can kind of back up to verse 17. Elijah, when you have that, will you read it for us, please? Ephesians 2, 17 and 18. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access to one Spirit, to the Father. Alright, so we just read in John that I am the door of the sheep. And here we see in verse in Ephesians chapter 2, 17 and 18, that he's speaking to those that Jesus comes, he speaks to those who are far off, to those who are near. And then we see in verse 18, what is he called? We have what? Access. What does the door provide? Access. But there's a dividing wall there. And so, but you can see what's on the other side of the, the wall through the door. You walk through the door. And that's what we see being um, stated here in John chapter uh, 10 as well, is that he is the, um, the door. He'll continue on in this idea of the door. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Now remember, he just said, I am the door of the sheep. Where did he say the thieves and the robbers were coming through? Not the door. Not the door. Where are the Pharisees in their teaching the sheep? Are they using the door or are they using some other method? Some other method, some other way of eternity. Not the door. Not the door. Right. All right. And so in verse 9, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now, as we kind of read this, this is going to kind of call to memory for a lot of us a certain psalm. And what psalm do we think of when we start talking about pastures and shepherds and sheep? Lord. Psalm 23 is the one that really kind of comes to our mind, right? And if there is a Psalm 23 of the New Testament, you're about to read it. And he says um, uh, to go in and out of pasture, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. If you, let's look at a few other cross references um, in this. Psalm, of course, Psalm chapter 23, and we kind of know what that says, but here are some of the others that I found. Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 14. Ezekiel 34 and verse 14 says, I will feed them with good pasture. And on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. And if you continue on, it says, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. Now who is that speaking there? Yeah, if you, if you back up to verse 11, it says, Thus says the Lord God. And He just called Himself what? The shepherd of His sheep. And now we see what's happening over in John chapter 10. If you will go ahead and turn back there. A lot of, I'm going to make the mark there in John 10 because we're going to be going back and forth. But what we see is He says, um, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go on to in and out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and make it more abundantly. In verse 11, 
I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So, now we have the benefit of looking back in time and seeing the sacrifice that was made. They didn't have that benefit, but what is Jesus telling them here? Basically, he's identifying his positions. Yeah. He's part of the Godhead. Yeah, and we see that in, in Ezekiel, and we also see, so he's reaching back in Ezekiel, and possibly uh, Psalm 23 as well, but, um, but we see him reaching back there in Ezekiel, and then he's also reaching forward when he says, I lay down my life. Because we don't see that in Ezekiel, and we don't really see that anywhere else um, in some of those Old Testament passages. But what we do see is him saying this, this statement. All right, let's move along. In verse, 11, in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And then he goes on, he who is a hired hand is not a shepherd who does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and he flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. And this is also a reference to some of the Old Testament passages as well. That first statement that he makes about him being the good shepherd, there are a whole host of Old Testament uh, prophecies that we can look at. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 11 is one of them. Ezekiel 34, Ezekiel 37, Zechariah 13, 7. A lot of those are talking about the exact same thing that Jesus says here. But when he uh, switches gears and starts talking about um, he is a hired hand, if you will, turn to Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 2. And the reason I want to kind of reach back there is because an incident happens a little later on inside of uh, John chapter 10 um, as to, you know, they're, they're wanting to stone him again. And there's a reason they want to stone him. So in this, I want to kind of set up what he's actually saying here. Now he's talking about those hired hands. In Ezekiel chapter 34, starting in verse 2, it says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? Should you eat the fat and clothe yourselves in the wool? You slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the hills and the mountains <clears throat> on high. My sheep were scattered all over the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. So we see here this prophecy that's happening here in Ezekiel is being played out through whom? Christ. Well, through Christ. Through, through Christ, but through the uh, Pharisees. Yeah, that, that's who that Scripture is for. is for the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the, the ruling um, elite of the time. And that is... They had a job to do. They were supposed to be sheep, but look at what they've done. And it says, you know, they basically made sure that they, that they got fed, but they didn't make sure that anybody else got fed. What are they doing of those sheep? They're stealing from them. They're robbing them. They're thieves. All the good stuff that should be going to the sheep, they are keeping for themselves. That's what... Uh, Ezekiel is saying here. And, and so what we see here is that because they, they see that, and then we see he calls them shepherds, but then if you move on down in verse, in, and I'm still in Ezekiel, in verse 4, there towards the very last part, I'm sorry, verse 5, it says, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. So their job of what they were supposed to do, they weren't even doing. They, they can't even be considered shepherds. 
even though they may call themselves that. Any questions or comment? All right, let's move on back to John chapter 10. We also see this being played out. Um, another one was uh, Jeremiah chapter 23. And it basically says the same things. And he goes on to talk about those, those um, shepherds that steal from the sheep. And he says, Behold, I will tend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. And so that's exactly what's happening here is God's sheep are now being called, and they're being called by that special shepherd in which they recognize the voice of. All right, let's move on down. In verse 13, he flees because the hired hand is not concerned about the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. And we see a lot of that start to play out in Ephesians chapter 2, but let's kind of back up just a little bit. And, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, if you will, go ahead and turn, or go ahead and look back at uh, verse 13. Um, he flees because he's a hired hand. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, it says this, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. So, Who's he talking about there in 1 Peter chapter 5? Elders of the church. Yeah, he's talking about elders of the church there. And you see how he says, you are overseers of that flock. So it is a pretty stern warning of what he's given him in, in light of what Jesus is talking about here in John chapter 10. It is not something that you just kind of go and make decisions and that's it. You actually have to care for the sheep. You have to make sure that the sheep are being fed the way they should be and they're not being scattered about. And so, you know, I, I threw that in there just so that we would understand the gravity um, of, that, uh, of the eldership that, um, that we continue to read about. Um, turn on back to John chapter 10. Uh, John chapter 10. And he says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. We've already uh, covered that. And then in verse 15, even as the Father knows me, I know the Father. So they're kind of one and the same. And I lay down my, sh my life for the sheep. So he understands what his mission is. He understands what God wants of him. He understands the sacrifice is about to happen. And that's what we kind of see in that. And is it the Father's will that this happens? Yes, absolutely it is. It is absolutely His Father's will that it happens. Alright, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll start in verse... We'll start in verse 11. And it says... Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, so there's something dividing us, and that is there's a Jew and there's a Gentile, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed by the flesh of human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise having no hope, and you were without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off, now remember what he says here in John 10, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, 
who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier wall, the barrier of the dividing wall, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, ordained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And so what we see here is in Ephesians chapter 2 is he's talking to the Gentiles and the Jews and there's a dividing wall between the two of us. And what is it? What was the difference between a Jew and a Gentile? The Jews were holding to the old law, the circumcision. Right. The law of commandments was, was the difference between a Jew and a Gentile. Because the Gentiles were. Correct. And then, in order, because you have two groups, two different groups, in order to make those groups into one, what has to happen? That law has to go away. And so he broke down that dividing wall between the two, and he created out of the two different people a new man called a Christian. And what we see in John chapter 10 is he says in verse 16, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. And now keep that in mind as I read this again in Ephesians chapter 2. And it says that he himself, he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And so we see that Jesus is pointing basically to the future of what's about to happen, and that is the Gentiles are going to be brought into this flock as well. There's going to be access to anyone who wishes to have access to, to this flock and to this shepherd. And again, what's the difference? They can hear, they recognize the voice, they, it's a very distinguishing voice to them, and that's who they're going to follow. All right, anything else? All right. Let's move on. In verse 17, For this reason the Father loves me, and here's why, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. Now, when he says that, the Father loves him because he's laying down his life. When you look at Ephesians chapter 2, you can see what God wanted between the Gentiles and the Jews. He wanted peace between them. So he laid down his life, and it says, for he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances so that he himself might make the two in, into one, um, one new man. And so what we see is it has always been the Father's goal and his desire, his wish, that there's peace. That there's not all of this chaos that we see in the world. And he did, he wanted that so much so that he did what in verse 17? He laid down the life of his son. And, and he also says, I'm doing this willingly. I lay down my life. Ain't nobody going to take it from me. I lay down my life so that I can take it again. No one has taken it away from me. But I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. So what he's saying is this is what the Father wishes of me. This is what He wants. This is what I'm doing. This is why the man was healed. This is why all these um, things are happening. This is why you know, I'm speaking what I'm speaking. And in verse 19, after he kind of finishes this, um, this discourse, a division occurred among the Jews because of these words. Now, I thought it was words that supposed to be bearing peace. So what happens here? Some understood it and some didn't. Exactly. The sheep are being separated. A division occurred among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, He has a demon. He's insane. Why do you keep listening? Others said, These are not the sayings of a demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? So what are they pointing back to as their evidence that he needs to be listened to? The miracles. 
And see, that's the way Jews are. I mean, Jews, they, they have a hard time hearing, so they have to see things. But what we see in the Gentiles is a lot of times just the words of what Jesus says is enough to convert them over to, to believe in it. However, what we see here is that they're pointing back you can't say that he's demon possessed. These are not the words of a demon possessed person. Explain to me the, the blind man actually being able to see. All right, and it kind of stops there. Now, in verse 22, kind of starts a new, I won't say a, it just starts kind of a, a new story, a new part of the story, I should say. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. What was the Feast of Dedication? Hanukkah. It was, it's what we consider to be Hanukkah, or the Festival of Lights. Why was it being celebrated? Why did, why did they do... What, what's Hanukkah for? The Jews had retaken the, the area and the temple back during the 400 years of silence, and they had consecrated and cleared out the the temple and they were trying to purify it but they didn't have enough oil to keep the lights burning on the candles but miraculously the, the lights kept burning it's a, it's a remembrance of that, that supposed miracle but the, the consecration of what this book applies to which is the purifying and making holy of the place of worship to God and that's kind of what this, this, this passage relates to Correct. And we do see that it was created as a feast. Now I want to point out that it was created as a feast much later than Moses. It did happen during the years, uh, the biblical years of silence. And so whenever we see that, and you can kind of see uh, this, and if you look at some parallel passages between some of the others, this is also some of the times that, the, um, that some of the other writers write whenever Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. So he's using that kind of backdrop in order to, you know, say I'm the light of the world. In in John's account, however, it's talking about this is the feast of dedication. It was happening at the temple. Um, it was winter. Um, in verse 24, the Jews uh, the, the Jews then gathered around him, and they were saying to him, "How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly." <laughs> so some of them still just not believing. And Jesus said. I told you, you do not believe. Now that right there is enough of a statement that he just says to say, you just don't believe it. And he says, I, I, I did tell you, you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. So it's not about just a matter of just what I say, but it's what's happening also right in front of you. And it's the very things that you can, guys continue to complain about. The Jews were complaining about him doing it on the Sabbath. They were complaining about how he does it. They were complaining about the speech that kind of comes after. They did everything they possibly could to deny that he was the Christ. But yet we still have people walking up to him. Just tell us plainly. If you're the Christ, tell us. What else is he supposed to do? What else would it take? What would it take for us? They're blaming Christ for their unbelief. And that's what people do today. If they could just see one more miracle or just have some sign... It's all there, just like Christ told these folks. You, you've seen it. You've heard me. You won't believe. It's their fault, not Christ's fault. Right? right. And, you know, the thing is, again, it's just the evidence of it, and they're just completely denying any kind of evidence. We see that, as you pointed out, John, we see that today. Um, we see it, you know, on the atheist side, but we also see it in the religious side as well. And, you know, just a complete denial of what that actually says. Mark 16, 16 does not say what I think it says. And so, you know, we see a complete denial of what's being stated to us. But the fact is this. Someone who says, I don't understand this. I don't, I, I don't recognize it as authority. I don't, I'm not going to believe it. They're just not of a sheep. What can you do to change that? Well, let me ask you this. Did all of these people believe with just the first miracle or just the first speech? But what does Christ do? He continues on. And more people believe because of that. And so that's kind of what we have to do also. That's our job. Go ahead. I said just trying to continue to teach. Yeah. 
I mean, just because one time you said something to somebody and they say no, no, no. Well, give them another chance. Right. Keep going. And I, and I also want to point out in John chapter 10, whenever um, we see that these that this shepherd is speaking or the words that he says and his sheep do what? Hear my voice. They hear it, but what do they do? They start to follow him. So it's not that he forces anything, but they start to follow him. They come to him, and that's the way we have to be as well, is we have to kind of come to that realization that that is a very distinct voice that I must follow. And um, so we're, we're kind of seeing that kind of played out here also in these later chapters of John chapter 10. And then he says... Um, I told you don't believe me in verse 26 but you do not believe me because you are not of my sheep so he's pointing back to that and then he says excuse me <coughs> my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give uh, eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand I and the Father are one. So he makes a blanket statement here, a very, a, a, a very um, broad statement about his sheep and how they are following him and they're his. And who are they given by? The Father. And what we also see is that they're going to follow him, but there's a reward at the end. What's the reward? Eternal life. And now if you remember back in the, in the speech that he was given before, that whenever they come to him, what does he offer them? Green pasture. A place of peace. A place of rest. And we see this being played out here also. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. So you're always going to have that place of rest. And he goes on to say, ain't nobody going to take them out of my hand. And so whenever we find ourselves that we are following Christ, it should be abhorrent to us to follow other shepherds' voices. We always need to kind of go here to find out where do I need to take my next step because I want to be able to follow with where Christ is, is going. Anything else? Mike, it's, yes. it's an interesting statement that, that we make is my sheep hear my voice and what was the next thing we say? Uh, and then my sheep will follow me. But also inserted in that is, I know them. Right. And that, what a wondrous thing that is, is that if we hear the, the shepherd's voice and we follow him, we'll insert it in between those two is that God knows us. Christ knows us. He's, they're aware of and, and they know us. You know, personally, you could say, and you put those things, all, those things all together, and that equals eternal life. Well, you know, John, in the, in the idea also, whenever we... Um, there in Matthew, whenever he says, you know, we've got this scene of, um, of the judgment, and it says, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your name? Did we? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. And so, it, you're right, it's a two-way street that has to happen. You've got to know God, but God has to recognize you as part of his fold first. And, um, you know, we tend to kind of leave that part out of it, you know, but yeah, you're exactly right. Alright, so he says this, uh, this, and they're tired of hearing about the sheep. And the shepherd and the doors and everything else and all that weird demon-possessed stuff. So, what do they decide they're going to do in verse 31? Stones. They decide they're going to pick up some stones and stone him. Now they ask a question, and he was answering the question. What was their question? Are you God or not? Are you are you the Christ? Just say it. Just tell us. Just just be plain about it. Why are you talking to us in all of these figures of speech? So he answers it. Obviously, they understood what he was saying because it it, it ignited some kind of passion in them. And then we see. Jesus answered them and said, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which one of them are you stoning me? So he points back to what? 
for the miracles, the works that they can. They, it's absolutely undeniable. And he points to them. He says, "Which one are you going to stone me for?" And the Jews answered, "For a good work, we're not going to stone. We're not going to stone you because of the blind man. We're not going to stone you because of all those good works that you did. But for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God." So, what was their question? <laughs> was the Christ? Are you the Christ? Right. He answers, "Yes." Now they want to stone him because he said he was the Christ, because he made himself out to be God. And then he answers this in verse 34. Jesus answered them, "Has it not been written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the Scripture cannot be broken." Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent to the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? So, what's he referring to here? Anybody know? Is the 82nd Psalm? Yes. Uh, it is uh, Psalm chapter 82. I'm sorry, what? Verse 6. Yes, if you will, go ahead and read that. Psalm 82, verse 6. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. So, what he's saying here, and you can kind of back up a little bit and see that they um, that he's talking about some of the enemies of God and how long you know you'll uh, judge unjustly, how to show partiality to the wicked, uh, give justice to the weak and to the faithless, to the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and destitute. And then he goes on to say, I said you are God, sons of the Most High, all of you. There's a certain um, part of God that resides in us. And that's what Jesus is kind of saying here. Is the, the willfulness to do the right thing, to show justice, to love, to show compassion, all of those things are God-like. And we are the sons and the children of God because of those things. All of you are. All of you have the capability of that. So whenever he makes that statement, he says, whenever he says that, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, why the very one that God sends, and that is the Christ, are you saying that he's blaspheming? <laughs> If you do not, in verse 37, if you do not do the works of my Father, if I'm sorry, if I do not do the works of my Father, now remember what they said about, they were about to stone him. Why? Not because of the works that he did, but because he said he was God. And then he says, if I do not do the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. They're about to make a very big mistake. That's really what he's saying here. If anything, just look at the evidence of the works that have been done. And then what are they, what's their response to that? Verse 39. Capture him. To capture him. Again, him being the sly little fox gets out of there somehow. But what we see is this whole exchange is about this sheep and this all of this kind of stuff. It is evidently starting to stick with people, and it's starting to people are starting to kind of hear the words, and it's also starting to divide people. And really, what it's doing is it's causing a judgment upon these people. And so, whenever we say that judgment starts. Right here's where it's kind of starting is people who don't believe in what he's saying. They've done. they got all these works that they can say. All right, in verse 40, and he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing. And he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. 
Verse 42 says a lot about that teaching and everything else that's been going on. It says many believed in him there. So some of the teaching is actually starting to get through. And who's it getting through to? Sheep. To the sheep. To his sheep. To his fold. And the one, and we see still, you've got these others who are still wanting to stone him. Um, and what do we know about them? Well, we back up to John chapter nine and verse forty-one. Jesus said to them, "If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin is remaining with you." And so this whole thought and everything else that John kind of paints for us, to me, it is showing that. You know, we, we have a very distinct voice in which we have to follow. And looking at the Scriptures, making sure that we are molding our lives by that and not just the philosophy of man because the philosophy of man is, let's just stone him. However, what we see is that Jesus is saying, I'm the Good Shepherd. I have something I want to give to my sheep. Go ahead, John. Mike, do you think that verse 36 there ties in the, is the reason that John mentioned that piece of dedication that that was when the temple was consecrated and, and Christ mentions that that God consecrated Him just like the feast that they're remembering right now which was the consecration of the of the temple being made holy again well now there's a new temple which is which is Christ that's, that's coming and He's trying to draw the people they're thinking about it already so since they're thinking about it Christ drives it home with God consecrated me. Uh, I haven't thought of that, but that will probably go in my notes. Uh, I think it's a pretty good um, point that you bring out. You know, just the fact that the backdrop of what we're looking at of that feast of dedication or that you know sanctifying of the temple at the time of that, and they're celebrating that, and then I am sanctified of my Father as well. I, I think that's a very good point. Anything else? All right, another uh, another chapter down. We're halfway through, so hang in there, and I will we'll do this again on Wednesday.